afternoon. Who was that man? Dear Lord. God bless, Pastor. Praise the Lord. It's like the pastor that was requested, the, the pastor that couldn't sing very well that was requested to sing on a hill far away. He didn't know how to take that. Stood a old rugged cross. Praise the Lord. So happy to be here. I know you're happy to be here. Guess what? Jesus is coming very soon. And it glads in my heart to be able to tell you that, that Jesus is coming very, very soon. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. As I mentioned in Bible study, we are entering the 70th year. 70 is a very significant number. It's even more significant than number 50 and so forth. And you see all the nations assembling in the Middle East. There's a war coming. There's a war coming. Nuclear weapons are being moved around, shuffled around. There's a war coming. Amen. Get ready to... For something that's been prophesied for thousands of years. Be excited that you can pray that you might be found worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Churches aren't preaching that, that the world war, that something's about to happen. They want to deal in generalities, but I'm here to tell you get ready. Get, get ready. Praise the Lord. We want to ask you to turn with us to the book of Galatians, chapter number 2, verse 20. I was blessed with that worship interlude there, man. God bless. See, pastor's blessed. He can do, he can, he can get, you know, get excited and urge you to worship. And uh, he can do it with 400 people. I used to do it with 20. And I was pulling teeth when me and some, me and my wife were worshiping, and maybe one other person, and it was hard. But I tell you what, you had to have put the word. You have to have the worship on the inside. Right. Amen. I learned to preach to, you know, whether it be a hundred or or ten, a small, home mission service. I could I'd preach the same, right. because it's when it's on the inside, what's on the outside is not going to affect you. Right. Amen. That's what you have to learn to do. Be, turn yourself over to the Holy Ghost and be blessed. Galatians 2, verse 20. <clears throat> I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now I want to take some time. I want to use this thought. The Lord's greatest message. Amen. The Lord's greatest message. Turn to someone and say, I want to hear the Lord's greatest message. You may be seated. Now, I'm not saying that the message I'm going to preach is the greatest message. I want to preach about the Lord's greatest message. Amen. I want to <clears throat> somehow bring it to your attention. And I need, with the help of the Lord, I need the Lord's help today because I had a message and the I told my wife, she asked for a title, and I gave her the title, and the Lord changed the message, but I think I can use the same title. So I'm going to open my mouth, and I believe God is going to fill it. Amen. I need the inspiration of the Holy Ghost today. There are, when you read the scriptures, you read about all the sayings of Jesus are, the greatest words that have ever been uttered. Many would say that the Beatitudes is, is the, 
or the Sermon on the Mount is the greatest message that the Lord ever preached. I, I agree that it is a great, great message. And it is one of the greatest messages, no doubt. But I want to preach, and I feel like I have a, uh, a little insight for today on His greatest message. And I want to attempt to share this with you, and I pray that, that the Holy Ghost would help me to, to get this, what I have on the inside, somehow into your mind and into your spirit that you might think on it whatever time we have remaining here on this earth. Now I want you to consider these things because we are truly in a very, very, very uh, dangerous point in human history. And so as I was talking to the Lord, meditating this, this, this morning, these thoughts came to me, and I could see the Lord, how close we are to the Passover, and Passover is just going to happen, it's going to take place next week, and I didn't realize that, or I had forgotten about this, the, and the, I felt the Spirit of the Lord putting these thoughts in my, in, my, in my mind and in my being. If you ever have the Lord talk to you, he doesn't, he's not going to say audible words to you, all right? He's not going to say audible words, as has happened, I've heard testimonies. The Holy Ghost said, turn left, and the person turned left. It didn't mean, you know, become a Democrat. It meant just take a left, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but for whatever reason, they, you know, they were committed with direction. I've never had that happen to me because the Lord speaks to me in, in thoughts Amen. or in pictures. And that's the way we think. We pretty much we think in pictures and we express. So he is, I realize that he speaks in thoughts. Why? Because he is the Logos. He is the thought. And that's the way he will put a thought into you. And it's up to you to stop and meditate and think on a good thing that whatever the Lord has impressed you on. Many of you not realize that, that you, many times you think it's you. But if you've been praying, you've been seeing God, he'll, he'll speak to you in a thought. And once you get into that thought, that thought it has a lot of expression in it. And you'll start to get the gist of how to walk in the spirit or how to talk to the Lord. and Your walk with God will improve. Well, I was talking to the Lord today and, and uh, I came across this, this thought that when Jesus was on the cross, I could see him on the greatest stage that was ever meant to be. That he was suspended between heaven and earth. And he had the attention of, of everyone in Jerusalem. And unbeknownst to us, it would be, it was God's plan of the, the expression and the message that he was sent out to mankind that would transform lives, whosoever would hear it. We hear that the preaching of the cross is foolish to them that perish, but to us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. We preach the cross. We preach, and not just an empty cross, but we preach Christ crucified and what he did. And so as I was sitting thinking about these thoughts, I realized this, that that had to be, that wooden cross had to be and is the most famous pulpit that has ever existed. The seven things that Jesus said on the cross have to be looked upon and studied because there is so much that he says in these seven utterances that will escape us if we don't stop, look, and listen to what the Lord is saying to every one of us. Now, of these saints, he three of them are three of them are recorded by Luke. Three of them are recorded by John, and then Matthew and Mark record one and the same. And when he places these thoughts, when he places these thoughts out there, it never occurred to me for whatever reason. I've read them, I've looked at them, but I now have come to realize that. This has to do, and this has to be part of the greatest message, the greatest 
utterances that the Lord has ever given to us as individuals. Collectively, they'll bypass it. We'll, say, we'll talk about them. They're, they're scattered in the, in the Gospels. But when you and I look at them, we should look at them and say, how is it applicable to me? Why? You know, why should these be so important to me? Or, or we should look at them because they're, they could be so important to you and I. And as I looked at them, I realized, my goodness, these are, this is one of the most wonderful expressions. And these six hours that Christ was on the cross, these this sums it up of what a saint should be. This really ought to talk to our spirits as we are in prayer. We ought to somehow be able to touch on one of the things that the Lord has said. For, for instance, he, these are, are the things that he said. He started out with, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second one was, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The third one, woman, behold thy son. And to the disciple he said, behold thy mother. The fourth was, my God, he, he spoke in a, in, 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 a, in a language. And he said, Eloi, uh, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which is interpreted, Father, forgive them. Excuse me, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fifth was, I thirst. The sixth was, it is finished. And the seventh was, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And I looked at that and, and it struck me like, I, it, it, like it never, I've never felt it before. I looked at those words and, and I realized the Holy Ghost just spoke to my spirit and I felt that, that, that scripture that comes to us and says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In other words, when, you, when that verse comes to you, we are supposed to launch back at that cross. And we have instruction that when we are crucified with Christ, these words are supposed to come into your life and they're supposed to affect you like they've never affected you before. And so I realized that the greatest message that he could ever, that he ever preached had to do with you and I. We would be the preachers. We would be the individuals. You that would obey these words would be the greatest message that would ever be sent. Where he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I am alive. Uh, there would be something that you and I would, would, would take a hold of. We would take the message uh, and we would put it into our spirit. And we would live a different life. Would you give the Lord a clap offering right now? When you become... Christ-centered is not just a Christ-centered thinking, heavenly thinking. It is a crucifixion with Jesus. That we are supposed to be able to feel, in a sense, uh, his words come through us that were uttered on Calvary. What did he say? Father, forgive them. That everyone that was really going to be crucified would learn forgiveness uh, and how to forgive in their life. No person can show the life of Jesus without living a forgiving life. If you are a person that has harbored hatred or, 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 or ill will, listen, you're not crucified. You are not living the life that Jesus demands for you to live if you're going to make it in the rapture. Oh, can you hear me out there? He, Jesus just didn't utter these words uh, into the air. Truly, this is what he did. But to the person that is crucified with Christ, he lives the crucifixion. He lives the event. He lives 
in a crisis. Uh, he lives uh, in a place uh, where not very many Christians or individuals know where to live. This is why uh, people, you can be despised. This is why people can look at you uh, as your foolishness. Uh, it should be an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, rather than having a forgiving spirit the way you have. They looked at Jesus and they mocked him. When you become crucified with Christ, your attitude is going to have to, you, you, listen, you can be baptized, you can understand the things about the group, but if you are not crucified with Christ, if you are not purposely put yourself on that, on that cross and held on to the same nail hands, put yours on the nail feet and cried at the same time, listen, they were crucifying the create the creation was crucifying the creator and he said father forgive them i am here listen you are here for a greater purpose life is not fair that's why we have the issue of forgiveness that that that's our escape that is our release Forgiveness is our release into the powerful walk with Jesus. You die, yet you live. He said, I'm crucified. Nevertheless, I live. See, a lot of individuals, they think if they live a crucified Christ, they're not going to live. They think they're living right now. But they're not alive. They're dead in their sins. They're perishing uh, even as they, in the things that they partake of. They haven't learned uh, how to forgive. It becomes, a, it has to be a part of you. The first instinct should not be revenge, it should be forgiveness. It should not be a reaction, it should be action. Purposeful action. The second saying, he said this, there was a thief on the left and on the right, and one of them said, save yourself and us. One rebuked the other one and said, this man's innocent. You and I, we deserve what we've got coming, but this one, and, and then he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He looked in a far, he looked at Jesus. I know that there's a cubby kingdom in the far future. He said, my Lord, remember me way in the future. But Jesus said, this day, this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. In other words, as they were communing, they were not going to be separated. That day, and here's what the crucified saint does fails to remember crucified with Christ if you're crucified with Christ uh, he is there with you right then and there today you don't have to be worried about the tribulation up ahead uh, you you've got a connection uh, Lord we know you're coming so soon he's you might well figure it this way he is with me right now I am secure right now. This day, I feel like I'm in paradise. Uh, this day, I feel like I can sit in the heavenly places. Right now, I feel not like the victim, but I realize I am the victor. I have the victory. You can be crucified with him and have a promise uh, that everything is all right. Not going to be all right. Uh, you have to believe everything. Everything right now is everything is all right if you can reach out and grab a promise right now you'll see it manifest tomorrow this day man the crucified saint realizes this you hold fast to it you if you're down lonely depressed uh, this day stop thinking about tomorrow well tomorrow you know that's hope Grab a hold of hope uh, manifested today. 
this day I declare that this day I shall live and not die. This day I'm going to make it. Why? Because the Lord is crucified, was crucified, and I am crucified with Christ. Uh, nevertheless, I am alive as I'll ever be. Uh, that's why God will transform your life. He will set you on a rock that is higher than I. He will place you in a wonderful place. Can someone shout amen? amen. The third saying. The third saying, he looked at his mother. She looked at his widowed mother, and he looked at John, and he looked at her and said, Woman, behold thy son. And to the disciples, he said, to the disciple John, he said, Behold thy mother. When you become crucified with Christ, your relationship changes. It becomes Church centered. It becomes your relationship changes. You have a natural mother and then you have spiritual mothers, which outnumber your natural mother. That was Jesus' mother. He looked at John, that's your mother. Mother, that's your son. Yeah. That, the, that you teach and respect anyone that is older than you. Uh, that, yeah, if you know, that's what people don't understand. I don't know how you've been raised up, but if you're a young person, you don't ever talk down uh, to an older person because you're not crucified. You're not where you should be. You're not, uh, you're not under the blessing uh, of the Lord. When you can argue with a saint that's older than you uh, and not realize, listen, I'm supposed to have a new kind of relationship right now. Yeah, she's old enough to be my mother. I need to treat her like my mother. If she's old enough to be your sister, you treat her like your sister. You don't treat her like a stranger. You treat her like if you see someone walk, yeah, and get baptized, you treat them like better, as good as is not better than a regular brother or a sister. Blood is not thicker than spirit. Though my family forsake me, I've got that Holy Ghost in me. I will be where the people of God are. Not where my family is. I am where my spiritual family is. I have been born again. Some of you need to be born again. You need to be born again. Why? How? By being crucified. You need to get down in your spirit. Not down in your craw. Down in your spirit. Where you learn to love the saints of God uh, and cherish the household of faith uh, and everything that is that, that is your priority. And hopefully your family will rally around you when you become anchored in the truth. And what is the truth? Jesus is the truth. Uh, he is the nail in a sure place. That relationship changes. The scripture says something to the effect that, that an individual that raises uh, up his servant the right way is going to have ultimately a son. Servants that were treated well by their masters, that were indebted to individuals, they were, they were, they were uh, uh, servants for debt. After seven years, they were released. They said, you can leave. You, you, the Lord said, I have to release. Your debt is paid. Forgiveness. Hey, your debt is paid. But if they wished to remain, they would take a nail 
and go up to the doorpost and put their ear up against it and put the awl in the ear on the earlobe. You want to pierce your ears? This is what you ought to do to the house of the Lord. They take a hammer. They take a hammer and nail them to the post. And that will signify, I love being your servant. He was nailed to the post. When you're crucified with Christ, you're saying, I am pleased to be your servant. Your household rules are not too much for me. Your, to be faithful is not too much for me. I want you to nail me to the wall. I want to remain in the house of the Lord forever. This has to be out of your saying. Out of the saints of Jesus, you have to take these attitudes. you got to become part of the greatest message that has ever been preached. You have to apply it into your spirit and to your... Can someone shout amen? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I smile because that word, I had to use that word. Nevertheless, I live. My dad will be talking about something and he'll talk about how bad things are this or, or he'll tell me. And then he has a phrase. He'll, he'll have a pause and he'll say, nevertheless. <laughs> Still don't know how he comes up with that word in sentences sometimes. Regardless. You have to decide to serve the Lord with all your soul, strength, and might. The number one commandment will take you to the cross itself. Yeah, you just might want to come to church to hear about Jesus. But when, the verdict, when, when you're called to make a decision, and you will have to make this eternal decision one way or another, yes or no, yea or nay. Gee, if you don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. He still exists. He's not, he's, not a, he's not a figment of our imagination. He's not an imaginary friend. That's how people tend to think, well, he must be an imaginary friend, you know. Now, he's more real than you and I are. He exists by himself. The fourth, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was that all about? Notice, he was on the cross, and he became sin for you and I. He was without sin, and became, he took on the sin of the world. And when the sin of the world fell upon him as the sacrifice, he was the mediator between for, for us that we would not have to die and go to hell. He took the sins from everyone from that time all the way back to Abraham, the household of faith. And that was all the bullocks that they had killed all that time had rolled the sin all the way to that fateful day. It had accumulated. And not only that, he saw into the future and all the sinners that would live, the 8 billion people that would live on this earth. And he had room for those that were going to call out on his name. And he granted forgiveness uh, if they would believe on his name. It was on his shoulders, the sin offering. And he began to cry out, Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani, he cried out, which was interpreted. Now listen, everyone that is crucified will speak in a different language. Everyone. 
That is true. Why? It needed interpretation. Whether they said it was Aramaic or not, nobody knows. But I can tell you this. It needed an interpretation because not every, not every, they didn't understand what he was saying. They said, is he crying now for Elias? Because Elias should come. Elijah's supposed to come. No. Every one of forbidden not to speak in tongues. In my name, they shall speak in new tongues. That's not debatable. That's what happened. The spirit is seeing him in an agony. Talk in a different language. He didn't have to do that for any reason. He could have just said it so, just so everyone would understand. But it was given for a New Testament church that would have to be crucified in the far field. Can, can I tell you, you will speak in new tongues. You will feel the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven itself. Don't you doubt it. Christian is being what Jesus did. When you are crucified with Christ and, you, uh, and you're dead to the world, you'll talk in tongues. Because when you're dead, you're not going to be thinking, should I, shouldn't it? Is it real? Is it not real? You simply go, when you're dead, you look at the word, you say, Jesus said, in my name, they shall speak in new tongues. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and they began to speak with other tongues. Why? Because they were crucified. With, they already knew there is no other way. But listen, that's just a half of it. That's just a little bit of it. Why hast thou forsaken me? What is that? Jesus had never sinned. And when the weight of sin fell on him, he could not communicate the way he wanted to communicate with the eternal father that was in him. The flesh had become the, flesh had become the sacrifice. And the father on the inside, the, the communication broke. It's like when you have a bad conscience. Without sinning. It's hard to talk to God when you have a bad. Yeah. You've been to church on Sunday and you're out drinking on Saturday night. You have a bad conscience. That's why you can't. You, that's why you have to play church. That's why you have to act church. This is why you have church without cru being crucified. This is why you keep faking everybody out and trying to be what you're not. But everybody around you knows, and they, and, they, and they pray for you, and they plead the blood for you. Oh, can I tell you, this is what happened. You lose consciousness of God because of sin. Why do we have the Holy Ghost? We have that Holy Ghost to lead us in God. So that when we feel sin, when you're crucified with Christ, let me, let me explain this. When you're crucified with Christ, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. Like Job, he has chewed evil. You learn to hate sin and love Jesus. Every time... You go, something that's even questionable, you, you get some, a check in your spirit. When you're crucified with Christ, uh, you, you, you learn how, well, you know, I don't have to dress that way no more because I'm dead now. I don't care. I, I don't care what others think about me. I'm going to be very presentable. I'm an emissary of the Lord. 
Women will not show their thigh anymore. Uh, they'll show less skin. Uh, they'll, they'll live less sin. Uh, they'll start to reconcile it. You know, this is the Holy Ghost. They don't have to be legislated to me. I'm crucified with Christ. Uh, yeah, I, I learn uh, and I'm feeling uh, that this is the right way, uh, that I should be modest in all things. Sin becomes exceedingly sinful. You'll feel sorry for the prostitute in the corner the way she's dressed and instead instead of saying man I wonder if that looked good on me you say Lord have mercy on her soul poor thing she doesn't realize what the devil's made her into you know, they don't realize what the devil has really clouded her mind and, 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 and they think that they're all that You learn that sin becomes an exceedingly sorrowful thing. So that when you're crucified with Christ and you fail, to, listen, you can be crucified with Christ and still stumble. I just stumble. Yeah. You don't keep stumbling over the same thing. That's just a bad walk. You stumble. You repent. And you say, okay, I learned from that experience. It's too painful, though, because that thing comes back into your mind. The devil always uses that and says, you know what you did, even though God forgave you for it. Yeah. And you don't want to stumble. One, if you, listen, whatever you did before you were baptized, no one has any, any right to go there at all. Nobody has a right to come and ask you about, hey, I heard uh, you've been married seven times, uh, and who's your husband now? Yeah, that's none of your business. When someone's been baptized, that's nobody's business what happened before that time. Now, if you have been baptized uh, and you start doing stuff like that, and the Lord forgives you, listen, that's going to leave a mark. And I give account for your soul. And even though God might forgive you that, I have a right to bring it up to the Lord. If it's a sin that's going to affect the church, I have a right to bring it up. Because it didn't happen way back then. It happened in, in the midst of the people of God. Then we have every right to be careful. Oh, have mercy. This is why when you live for God, you live a crucified life, you learn sin is sin. You know, I, I want to get as far away from it as I can. Yeah. A friend of sinners, they said, listen, that mean you're not going to love people that aren't in the church. But you're not going to do what they do. You're not going to give place to the devil. You're not going to have a drinking party in your home and you not drink. It sounds like nonsense, but it happens. Yeah. The, 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 the Lord's message on the cross. Notice. I have a plethora of glasses here. Got the right ones. The fifth, I thirst. We know that Jesus cried out. His blood was thickening. He, was, he needed water. And they offered him vinegar, sour wine. And he rejected it. The wines, the drinks of this world are... Not to be used for pleasure for the people of God. But one thing we're supposed to do is have a thirst. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They that want to drink, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yeah. Going to the well, give me something to drink. If you drink some of this water, woman... You'll never thirst again. 
Every, none of us should ever lose our thirst. As the heart panted after the water broke, so panted my soul after the old God. The, the heart was a deer that would smell water miles away. That's what you ought to be. Church, Sunday comes, uh, you got church time, living water. Got to get there. I thirst. I got to get there. Somehow, I've got to get my blessing. Somehow, I've got to touch God. Somehow, that's thirsting for God. I need more Holy Ghost today. I need, listen, I need more. I've got Holy Ghost. I need more Holy Ghost. I don't have enough Holy Ghost. I got to get rid of junk out of my life to leave, make room for more Holy Ghost. You got to get rid of stuff. Yeah, you might be full because the rest is junk and you have, this capacity is full. Got to get rid of some junk and get refilled. Get thirsty. Lord, I've lost my will to read. Lord, I need that thirst again. Listen, when you're filling yourself with junk drink uh, and with food, that you know, it's like junk food. It's like Coke, drinking Coke all the time. Guilty. When you drink Coke all the time, you don't need Coke, you need water. In case some of you here don't understand, it's not the kind, it's the kind you drink, not the kind you. <laughs> Can't be too careful. Because somebody, Bishop likes Coke. <laughs> I'm addicted, but to Jesus, not to anything else. Hey, that's what you have to do. <laughs> thirst. You have to thirst. If you don't have the thirst, figure it out. Say, Lord, pray. Lord, make me hungry and make me thirsty. Lord, that's what the... Look, you endured the cross, despising the shame. Don't ever be ashamed of Jesus. I said, don't ever be ashamed of Jesus. The world wants to make us ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Be ashamed of people that are ashamed of Jesus. Hey, you were in church the other day. Are you sure? No, it's not me. That's Peter. Yeah, we saw you. We saw you over there. No, no, no. That was not me. Yeah, we did see you. I'm telling you, it wasn't me. That's what we need in our spirit one of these days. When you're sort of semi ashamed, you hear that cock crow. Let's finish the Lord's greatest message. I thirst. You have to. How do you get thirsty? By exerting yourself. I mean, if you're a couch potato, you're not ever going to be thirsty. But if you get up and do something for the Lord, listen, if you don't have enough Holy Ghost, try and do it and you fail, awesome. You're going to say, man, I need more. I need more amperage here. I need more Holy Ghost power. I need more. Man, I just, you know, I try to cast that thing out and it laughed at me. This thing comes down, but by, they have to hunger and thirst. You know what? I want to have what they have. You see a dance that person, had? I want that dance. I want that, I want that prayer tongue, or that language. Oh, I want that. I, I want to feel you, Lord, the way that person feels when they when they lifting up and they're not impervious to everything else and they're in the third heaven with you. That's, Lord, what I want. Lord, I want more thirsty. I want more than I have right now. Listen, none of you should be satisfied. That's why, yeah, 
Don't be satisfied. Your wife is going to fail you. Your kids are going to fail you. Everyone around you is going to fail you. If you don't get thirsty for God, but if you get thirsty and you come to the well to drink uh, on a constant basis, they're going to look at you and that's going to be what they want. Does anybody want that today? I said, does anybody want that? Jesus said the sixth time, he said, it is finished. It is finished. That's important. Everything that had been prophesied, that had been written concerning the fulfilling of the law and up to the point where Jesus was going to be crucified, the eternal sacrifice presented. He said, this is all that I had to do. It is finished. He didn't say everything else is finished. He just said, this portion is complete. I'm not going to die again. There's not going to be any more sacrifice. This is the turning point of the world. The world will spin around. The, the spiritual will spin around this point in time. It is finished. You see, what he begins, he will finish. What he said he will do, he will complete. This is why you can start out and, and say, you know what, I'm going to live for God. Uh, you, all you have to be is crucified with him and hold fast to those nails. Uh, and he will become the author and finisher of your faith. You will never backslide. Not one time in serving God. That you won't have to have, do, uh, do a back step. Uh, you won't have to slide at all. Uh, you will just keep going forward with a small increments at a time. But you will finish the race. Paul said, I have finished my course. Why? In his own power? No. Jesus caused him not even to be afraid of dying. He said, I'm ready to be offered up. That meant have my head cut off. It, mean, it meant uh, 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 a, uh, how do you call it, a uh, libation, a, a poured out offering. He said, I'm ready to be poured out. They took, that's how he died. They cut his head off. I'm ready for it. How can, listen, when you are crucified with Christ, I don't know where to what point he's going to take you, but that's, that is commitment. That is, given, that is losing your life for him. That is just not even struggling with, am I going to live for God? Today? It's made up. It's made up. And the three Hebrew children, whether he delivers us, we don't know. But we're not going to bow to you. Right. <laughs> now, when you become, when, when, this is what the Lord is working on. He's working on your life, and he is going to finish your life. But it's going to take one more, one more step of this crucifixion. He cried out. Are you still with me? He cried out, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That is the ultimate trust. When you die, and everyone here is going to die or get raptured. In case you didn't know that, that's the bad news. But the good news he said, unto your hands I commit. I command, I commit, I give myself totally unreserved. Whatever you're going to do, into your hands. When a person is crucified with Christ, they're going to trust in the Lord with all their heart, soul, strength, and might, with no reservations. No, no if, ands, or buts. I've been to many a deathbed. And it's a totally different scenario when a person has been full of life 
And they're there, and, and they finally resolve to the point where I'm not going to live. I'm going to die. And there's, I, I don't know how, they re, but they somehow, in the way they have lived for God, they finally come to the point where they say, I'm ready. All these years I've learned, to, I've built my trust. And, tr and you know what? I haven't been the greatest trust champion, but I've trusted, trusted. But it's all for that one day. And that's what every saint has to practice. Lord, I don't know what you're going to bring today, but I'm going to trust in you. Into your hands, I'm going to commit my spirit this day. Then I'm dying, but yet I'm living. I'm not doing my will, I'm dying, but I'm doing your I'm living. You don't realize it's it, but it's a better life. It is a better life. There is no other life to live. So when you look at the seven sayings of Jesus and his greatest messages, the greatest message is the messenger, you. If you do these things, you become an epistle. You become a person that people look at you and they marvel that I knew him before, but he's different now. You're sending the right message. You're doing the work of the Lord. You're persevering, you're enduring, you're staying away from sin. They can tell you're a spiritual person. You talk about the Lord. All these things transpire in a life that is crucified. And that's how Jesus gets his greatest message out to the world. No one else could do this. Only you. Stand with me. Only you. No one else can do this. Maybe there's someone here tonight that wants to say, Lord, into your hands I commit my life, my spirit, my life force. In your hands can be guided and molded and, and made to be what it should be. I've done it my way. I've tried it his way. I've tried it. The way it was advertised, it didn't work. But Lord, I want to do this your way. This hour, if you feel the Holy Ghost has in any way talked to your spirit, I want to open this platform. I want to invite you to come and listen how you can be a participant in the Lord's greatest message. The message of the cross with you on it. I am crucified. I am crucified. I've got to learn what it means to be crucified. Have you forgiven those that have trespassed against you? Have you thought it over? Have you realized how sinful sin really is in relation to a holy God? Have you lost your thirst for the living God? Have you lost your unction? Lord, let it be in my spirit that I can cry out, I thirst. I thirst. I need more and more of Jesus. I need more and more of Jesus. The thought of foolishness is sin. When you get to know Jesus, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. It hurt him. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That's how we ought to sense doing evil. Lord, I don't want to hurt, I don't want to hurt my experience. I don't want to grieve the Holy Ghost. 
I don't want to grieve the Holy Ghost. I don't want to watch that anymore. I don't want to touch that anymore. I don't want to sing the song of drunkards. Save me, Lord. Draw me near. Draw me near to thy precious bleeding side. Draw me near. 